part one chapters nine and ten of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine monsieur de girus lets his tongue wag on arriving at aix marius went to isnard's in the rue d'italie the draper had not been molested no doubt such an insignificant prey was not considered worth capturing fine went straight to the jailer of the prison whose niece she was by marriage she had her plan and brought with her an enormous bunch of roses which was well received her pretty smiles her caressing liveliness made her in a couple of hours her uncle's spoiled child he was a widower with two young daughters to whom fine had once played the part of mother the trial was not to take place till early in the following week marius his hands tied no longer daring to attempt anything awaited the proceedings with anguish at times he was still mad enough to hope and to believe in an acquittal walking one evening on the cour he met m de girus who had come from lambesc to be present at the affair the old nobleman took his arm and without saying a word led him to his house there he said after closing the door of a large drawing-room now we are alone my friend i can come down from my pedestal as much as i please marius smiled at the count's rough and eccentric ways well the latter went on you don't ask me to help you to defend you against casalis come you're sensible you understand that i can do nothing against that vain and obstinate nobility to which i belong ah your brother has done a fine thing m de girus was striding about the drawing-room he pulled himself up abruptly before marius and said to him in a loud voice listen to what i am about to tell you there are some fifty of us in this good town all old fellows like myself living by ourselves buried in a past for ever dead we profess to be the cream of the cream of provence and there we stick doing nothing but twirling our thumbs for see you we are noblemen chivalrous hearts awaiting devoutly the return of their legitimate princes and the deuce take it we shall wait a long time so long that we shall have died of solitude and idleness before the least legitimate prince shows himself if we were gifted with good eyes we should observe the march of events we cry out to facts you shall go no farther and yet the facts pass quietly over our bodies and crush us it maddens me to see how we are shut up in an obstinacy as ridiculous as it is heroic to think that we are most of us wealthy that we might nearly all become intelligent manufacturers working for the prosperity of the country and that we prefer to grow mouldy in the recesses of our mansions like the rubbish of a bygone age he stopped to take breath and then went on still more energetically and we take a pride in our empty existence we don't work because we disdain labor we have a holy horror of the people because their hands are soiled ah your brother dared to touch one of our daughters we'll show him whether his blood is the same as ours we shall league ourselves together and give the rascalians a lesson we'll cure them of seeking to find favor in our children's eyes some powerful ecclesiastics will second us they are fatally bound to our cause it will be a splendid campaign for our vanity after a pause m de girus resumed sarcastically our vanity it has at times received some nasty knocks a few years prior to my birth a terrible tragedy was enacted in the mansion adjoining this m d'entrecasteaux the president of the parliament murdered his wife in her bed he cut her throat with a razor which was not found till twenty-five days afterwards at the bottom of the garden the victim's jewels were discovered down the well where the murderer had thrown them to lead the authorities to believe that robbery was the reason of the murder president d'entrecasteaux took flight and went i believe to portugal where he died in poverty the parliament condemned him in default to be broken alive on the wheel so you see we have also our scoundrels and that the lower classes have nothing to envy us that cowardly crime committed by one of ourselves dealt a sad blow in those days to our authority the novelist might write a heart-rending book with the materials furnished by this doleful and tragic story 
resuming his walk m de girousse continued and we also know how to humble ourselves for instance when fouché the regicide then duke of otranto was somewhere about eighteen ten exiled for a short time to our town all the nobles dragged themselves before him i remember an anecdote which will show you to what abject servility we lowered ourselves on new year's day eighteen eleven there was a long file of persons waiting to pay their respects to the ex-member of the convention in the reception-room there was some talk of the severity of the weather and one of the callers was expressing his fears as to the fate of the olive trees what do we care for the olive trees exclaimed one of the noble personages providing his grace the duke keeps well that's how we are nowadays my friend humble with the mighty haughty with the weak there are no doubt some exceptions but they are rare you must see therefore that your brother will be convicted our pride which bent the knee before a fouché cannot do so before a cayolle that's logical good night and the count abruptly dismissed marius his own words had exasperated him and he feared that his anger might end by making him say something foolish the next day the young man met him again and m de girousse took him home as on the previous evening he held in his hand a newspaper containing a list of the jury who were to decide philippe's case and struck the paper forcibly with his finger exclaiming those are the men who will condemn your brother shall i tell you some stories about them they are curious and instructive m de girousse seated himself and glanced through the paper shrugging his shoulders as he did so it's a packed jury he said at last an assembly of rich men who have every interest to serve the cause of m de casalis they are all more or less mixed up with the clergy or on intimate terms with the nobility they are almost all friends of men who spend their mornings in the churches and cheat their customers the rest of the day then he named them one by one and spoke of the set they frequented with increasing indignation humbert he said is the brother of a marseilles merchant a dealer in oil an honest man who holds his head erect and whom every poor devil salutes twenty years ago their father was but a struggling clerk to-day his sons are millionaires thanks to his skilful speculations one year he sold a large quantity of oil beforehand at the market rate a few weeks afterwards the coal destroyed the olive trees the crop was lost and he was a ruined man if he did not deceive his customers but he preferred deceit to poverty whilst his brother merchants were delivering the genuine article at a loss our man bought up all the spoiled and rancid oils he could find and then made the promised deliveries his customers complained and grew angry but the speculator coolly replied that he was strictly keeping to his agreements and that they could claim nothing further of him and the trick was played all marseilles which knows the story is never tired of taking its hat off to this skilful man gauthier is another marseilles merchant he has a nephew paul bertrand who swindled in style this bertrand was in partnership with a person named aubert living in new york who used to send him consignments of goods to be disposed of in marseilles they shared the profits our man made immense sums in this business the more especially as he was careful to cheat his partner at each division of profits one day a crisis broke out and losses were incurred bertrand continued to receive the goods which the ship still brought but he refused to honour the drafts aubert drew upon him saying that business was bad and he was in difficulties the returned bills come back again with enormous expenses attached to them then bertrand calmly says that he won't pay that he is not obliged to be aubert's partner for ever and that he owes nothing there's a fresh return of the bills fresh expenses incurred and the new york merchant surprised and indignant has to take them up at great loss the latter who had to plead through a power of attorney lost the action for damages he brought against bertrand i was assured that two-thirds of his fortune twelve hundred thousand francs were swallowed up in this catastrophe bertrand remains the most honest man in the world he is received everywhere and belongs to several congregations he is envied and honoured du is a dealer in corn 
some time ago one of his sons-in-law georges fouque met with a misadventure which caused a scandal that his friends hastened to hush up fouque always arranged matters so that it should appear that the cargoes the ships brought him had suffered in transport the insurance offices paid on the report of an expert but tired of continually paying the offices appointed an expert an honest baker who soon received a visit from fouque the latter whilst conversing on indifferent matters slipped a few gold pieces into his hand the baker dropped the coins and kicked them into the middle of the room there were several persons present yet fouque's reputation has in no way suffered delorme lives in a town not far from marseilles he retired from business long ago listen to the disgraceful action his cousin mill was guilty of thirty years back mill's mother kept a draper's shop when the old lady retired she sold her stock and goodwill to one of her assistants an active and intelligent young fellow whom she almost looked upon as a son this person whose name was michel quickly discharged the debt and so increased his business that he felt compelled to take a partner he chose a young fellow of marseilles named jean martin who had a little money and who appeared to be an honest hard-working man it was an assured fortune that michel offered to his partner at first everything went well the profits increased annually and each partner put by a good round sum at the end of the year but jean martin who was eager for gain and dreamed of a rapid fortune ended by reflecting that he would make twice as much if he were alone the matter was a difficult one michel was in fact his benefactor and moreover he had a friend in the landlord of the house madame mille's son if the latter were honest jean martin would be unable to put his nefarious scheme into execution he went to see him and found him to be the scoundrel he required he proposed to him to give him a new lease in consideration of a large sum of money he doubled and even trebled the amount mill who was both a rogue and a miser sold himself for as much as possible the bargain was struck then jean martin played the hypocrite with michel he said he desired to cancel the partnership deed and to start a business elsewhere he even named a place he had taken michel surprised but not suspecting the infamous trick of which he was to be the victim said he could retire if he liked and the deed was cancelled shortly afterwards michel's lease expired and jean martin armed with the new lease triumphantly turned his ex-partner out michel nearly driven mad by such a piece of treachery opened a business elsewhere but having no customers he lost the money so painfully amassed during thirty years of labour he died paralysed suffering atrociously shouting that mille and martin were scoundrels and traitors and calling on his sons to avenge him to-day his sons are toiling and moiling to keep body and soul together mill is connected by marriage with the best families in the town his children are wealthy and living handsomely in an odour of piety and possessing the esteem of all there's favre his mother was married twice her second husband being a man named chabran a ship-owner and bill discounter pretending he had made some unfortunate speculations chabran wrote one day to his numerous creditors to the effect that he was obliged to suspend payment some of them consented to give him time but the majority decided to proceed against him so chabran engages two young fellows as clerks and spends a week in coaching them up in the parts he wishes them to play then accompanied by these youngsters now thoroughly trained he calls on all his creditors one after the other bewailing his sad position and imploring their pity for his two starving sons who haven't a coat to their backs the trick succeeds admirably well all the creditors forego their claims the next day chabran was at the bourse more sedate and more insolent than ever a broker who had not heard of the affair asked him to discount three bills accepted as it so happened by three of the very merchants who had treated him so generously the day before i can have nothing to do with those kind of people he replied haughtily at the present time chabran has almost retired from business he lives in a villa where he gives sumptuous dinners on sundays as for Jérôminot, the president of the club where he spends his evenings is a usurer of the very worst description 
it is said that he has earned at the trade a snug little million which enabled him to marry his daughter to one of the princes of finance his name is Pertigny. but since his last failure which left him a capital of three hundred thousand francs sticking to his fingers he goes by the name of felix this skilful rascal failed a first time forty years ago and that enabled him to purchase a house his creditors received fifteen per cent ten years later a second failure procured him a little place in the country that time his creditors received ten per cent scarcely fifteen years ago he failed a third time on that occasion for three hundred thousand francs and offered a composition of five per cent the creditors having declined to accept it he proved to them that all the property was really his wife's and he never paid them a centime marius thoroughly sickened made a movement of disgust as though to stop these abominable stories you don't believe me perhaps said the terrible count you're a simpleton my friend i've not yet done and you must hear me to the end m de Girous railed in a dreadful manner his loud hissing words fell like the lash of a whip upon the persons whose disreputable histories he was relating he named the jurymen one after another he searched their lives and the lives of their relations and laid bare all the scandals and meannesses connected with them there was scarcely one he spared then he placed himself vehemently before marius and continued bitterly were you so simple as to believe that all these millionaires all these upstarts all these powerful persons who domineer over you and crush you to-day were little saints worthy individuals whose lives were spotless at marseilles especially these men display their vanity and insolence they have become devotees and hypocrites they have deceived even the worthy people who salute and esteem them in a word they form an aristocracy of their own their past is forgotten their wealth and newly acquired probity are alone seen well i'll unmask them listen this one made his fortune by betraying his friend that other by trafficking in human flesh that other in selling his wife and daughter that other in speculating on the misery of his creditors that other in buying back for a song the shares of a company of which he was manager and which he had brought into disrepute that other by scuttling a ship loaded with stones instead of merchandise and securing a handsome sum from the underwriters that other verbally a partner by refusing to pay his share of the losses in an unfortunate speculation that other by concealing his assets failing two or three times and ultimately living like an honest man that other by selling as wine a decoction of logwood or bullock's blood that other by buying up all the corn at a time of scarcity that other by defrauding the customs on a large scale attempting to corrupt the officers and robbing to his heart's content that other by forging the signatures of friends or relations to bills which they do not dare to dishonour at maturity but prefer to pay rather than disgrace the forger that other by setting fire to his factory or ships previously insured far above their value that other by tearing up and burning his acceptances snatched from his creditor's hand the day they fell due that other by speculating at the bourse without any intention of paying his differences which does not prevent him enriching himself a week afterwards at the expense of some dupe m de Giroux stopped for want of breath he remained silent for some time giving his anger an opportunity of dying out then he again opened his lips and smiled less bitterly i am a bit of a misanthrope he said gently to marius who had listened to him with pain and surprise i see the dark side of everything the fact is the idleness to which my title condemns me has enabled me to study the ignominies of this country but i must tell you there are some honest folk among us unfortunately they either dread or disdain the rascals marius took his leave of m de Girous, quite upset by the ardent words he had been listening to he foresaw that his brother would be unmercifully condemned the trial was to begin on the morrow chapter x a scandalous trial all aix was in a flutter 
scandal acquires additional force in quiet little towns where the curiosity of the gossips has not frequently some fresh material to feed upon all the talk was of philippe and blanche the lover's adventures were related at every street corner it was openly said that the accused was condemned beforehand that m de cazalis had either personally or through his friends secured a promise of conviction from each juryman the ex-clergy gave the deputy its assistance though in a rather lukewarm manner it is true it comprised in those days some men who were unwilling to be parties to an act of injustice a few priests however submitted to the influence of the religious club of marseilles of which abbe donadey was so to say the leader these attempted in various ways to tie the hands of the magistracy they succeeded especially in persuading the jurymen of the righteousness of m de cazalis's cause the nobles rendered them powerful aid in their task they considered that their honour demanded they should crush philippe Cayolle. they regarded him as a personal enemy who having dared to attack the dignity of one of themselves had by so doing insulted the whole body of them to see these counts and marquises bestir themselves give vent to their anger and band themselves together one might have fancied that some hostile army was at the gates of the town yet it was after all simply a question of securing the conviction of a poor wretch guilty of love and ambition philippe however had some friends and defenders all the lower classes declared themselves freely for him they blamed his conduct and reproved the means he had employed saying that he would have done better to have loved and married a young woman in his own class of life but whilst censuring his behaviour they loudly took his part against the deputy's pride and hatred it was known throughout the town that blanche when before the examining magistrate had denied her love and the daughters of the people true provencal women enthusiastic and courageous spoke of her with insulting contempt they called her a renegade ascribed the most shameful motives to her conduct and did not hesitate to cry their opinions from the housetops in the expressive language of the gutter all this clamour compromised philip's cause considerably the whole town was in the secret of the drama about to be performed those whose interest it was to secure the prisoner's conviction being certain of succeeding did not even take the trouble to hide their proceedings those who would have liked to have saved him conscious of their weakness and unarmed condition relieved themselves by bawling delighted to annoy those powerful persons whom they had no hope of mastering m de cazalis had shamelessly dragged his niece with him to aix during the first days he took a sort of proud delight in walking her up and down the cour. it was his way of protesting against the idea of dishonour with which the crowd coupled the young girl's flight he seemed to be proclaiming to the world at large you see that a lout cannot damage the honour of a casalis my niece still looks down upon you from the height of her rank and fortune but he was unable to continue these walks long his behaviour angered the mob who insulted blanche and was on the point of stoning her and her uncle the women especially were furious they did not perceive that it was not the niece's fault and that she was simply submitting to an iron will she trembled before the popular wrath and lowered her eyes in order not to see those women gazing at her with such fiery glances she could feel their contemptuous gesticulations behind her hear horrible words she failed to understand and her legs were giving way beneath her as she clung to her uncle's arm in order not to fall she returned home one day pale and trembling and declared she would not go out again the poor child was going to become a mother at last the day of the trial arrived the doors of the court-house were besieged from early morning the place des Prêcheurs was filled with a noisy gesticulating crowd clamouring as to the probable result of the trial and discussing philippe's guilt and m de cazalis's and blanche's attitude the court-room slowly filled extra rows of seats had been added for the persons provided with tickets there were so many of them that the majority had to remain standing there were the flower of the nobility the leading barristers the high functionaries in fact all the nobilities of aix no prisoner had ever before had such an audience when the doors were opened for the admission of the general public only a few persons were able to find room the remainder were compelled to wait in the passages and even on the steps of the building and now and again the crowd indulged in groaning and hooting and the noise penetrated and swelled in the court-room and disturbed its quiet majesty 
the ladies had taken possession of the gallery and there formed a compact mass of smiling and anxious faces those in the front row fanned themselves or leant forward with their gloved hands resting on the red velvet covering the rail of the balustrade further back in the shadow rose serried tiers of pink faces their bodies scarcely discernible amid the mass of laces ribbons and stuffs and silvery laughter whispered words shrill little cries fell from this rosy gossiping crowd the ladies fancied themselves at a theatre when philippe Cayolle was brought in there ensued a great silence the ladies devoured him with their eyes some even examined him from top to toe with their opera glasses the big fellow with his energetic features was quite a success the women having come to judge of blanche's taste no doubt considered the young person less to blame when they beheld her lover's lofty stature and clear penetrating eyes philippe's attitude was calm and dignified he was dressed entirely in black and seemed to ignore the presence of the two gendarmes beside him rising up and reseating himself with all the grace of a man of the world now and again he calmly surveyed the crowd without the least effrontery he gazed several times up at the gallery and on each occasion he smiled in spite of himself so great was his wish to love and please even there the indictment was read and was overwhelming for the accused in the depositions of m de cazalis and his niece the incidents were distorted in a skilful and terrible manner it was stated that philippe had perverted blanche's mind by the aid of bad books the truth being that he had lent her two utterly puerile books by madame de genlis the indictment further said on the strength of blanche's version of the story that she had been carried away by force that she had clung to an almond tree and that during the flight the abductor had resorted to violence to oblige his victim to follow him the gravest allegation was founded on one of blanche's depositions she pretended she had never written philippe any letters and that the two produced by him were antedated ones which he had made her write at lambesque by way of precaution when the reading of the indictment was finished the place became filled with the noisy murmur of innumerable private conversations each spectator before coming to the court-house had his own version and now was discussing in a low voice the official one outside the mob was howling the presiding judge threatened to have the hall cleared and silence was gradually restored philippe's examination was then proceeded with when the presiding judge had asked the usual preliminary questions and had repeated to him the particulars of the indictment drawn up against him the young man without refuting them exclaimed in a clear voice i am accused of having been carried off by a young girl these words caused a general laugh the ladies hid themselves behind their fans to give full vent to their feelings philippe's words foolish and absurd as they seemed contained nevertheless a great deal of truth the presiding judge sensibly observed that no one had ever known a man of thirty to be carried off by a girl of sixteen to which philippe quietly replied neither has any one ever seen a girl of sixteen wandering along the highways passing through towns meeting hundreds of people without appealing to the first person she encountered to deliver her from her abductor her jailer and he endeavoured to show the material impossibility of the acts of violence and intimidation of which he was accused at every hour of the day blanche had been free to leave him to procure aid and succour if she had accompanied him it was because she loved him and had consented to the flight in addition to this philippe expressed the greatest affection for the young girl and the greatest deference for m de cazalis he admitted his errors and merely asked not to be branded as an infamous abductor the trial was adjourned to the morrow for the hearing of the witnesses that night the town was in an uproar the ladies spoke of philippe with affected indignation serious men referred to him more or less severely while the lower classes energetically took his part on the morrow the crowd outside the court-house was if anything larger and noisier than on the previous day the witnesses were nearly all for the prosecution m de girus had not been summoned his rough frankness was dreaded and moreover he should rather have been arrested as an accomplice marius had begged him not to compromise himself in the affair he also feared the old count's violence which might spoil everything there was scarcely more than the evidence of one witness in philippe's favour that of the innkeeper at lambesque who declared that blanche was accompanying her lover of her own free will 
this evidence was however effaced so to say by the depositions of the other witnesses marguerite the milkwoman stammered and said she no longer remembered having brought the accused any letters from mademoiselle de cazalis it was thus that each witness served the deputy's interest either through fear or stupidity and loss of memory the pleadings commenced and went into the third day philippe's counsel defended him with dignified simplicity he did not seek to excuse what was reprehensible in his conduct he described him as being an ardent ambitious man led astray by dreams of love and wealth but at the same time he showed that the accused could not be convicted of abduction and that the affair itself negatived all idea of violence and intimidation the crown attorney's speech was most vindictive it was expected that it would have been milder and his energetic accusations produced a disastrous effect the jury brought in a verdict of guilty and philippe cayolle was condemned to five years imprisonment and to be exhibited in the pillory on one of the public squares of marseilles the gardener ayes was only condemned to a few months imprisonment the sentences were received with murmurs in the court-room whilst outside the crowd howled with rage End of chapters nine and ten part one chapters eleven and twelve of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven how blanche and fine find themselves face to face when sentence was passed on philippe blanche was present hidden at the back of the gallery she was there by order of her uncle who had wished to completely stamp out her affection by showing her her lover standing between two gendarmes like a thief an elderly lady relative had consented to accompany her to this edifying scene as the two ladies were awaiting their carriage on the steps of the court-house the crowd pushing forward suddenly separated them blanche who was dragged to the centre of the place des Prêcheurs, was recognised by the market-women who began hooting and insulting her that's her that's her shouted the women the renegade the renegade the poor bewildered child not knowing where to fly to was half dead with shame and fright when a young girl energetically divided the howling mob that surrounded her and placed herself at her side it was fine the flower-girl had also been to hear a sentence passed on philippe for the space of nearly three hours she had passed through all the anguish of hope and fear the crown attorney's speech had been crushing and on hearing the judgment she had begun to weep she had just quitted the court-house irritated and in a terrible state of excitement when the hooting of the market-women reached her she understood that blanche was there and that she would be able to avenge herself by abusing her she dashed forward with clenched fists and an insult ready on her lip according to her the young girl was the great culprit she had lied she had been guilty of perjury and cowardice at this thought all fine's plebeian blood rushed to her face and urged her on to shout and strike she rushed forward and separated the crowd to take her share of vengeance but when she was face to face with blanche when she saw her doubled in two by fright she had pity for the weak and trembling child she found her so small so captivating so delicately fragile that a generous thought of pardon came from her heart she violently pushed back the women who were shaking their fists at the young lady and stretching herself to her full height she exclaimed in a loud voice and what now aren't you ashamed she is alone and you are a hundred against her the almighty doesn't require your shouts to punish her let us pass she had taken blanche's hand and stood erect before the murmuring people who drew closer together so as not to allow the two young girls to get through them fine awaited with pale and trembling lips and as she encouraged the little lady with a glance she perceived that she would soon be a mother she turned quite pale and advanced towards the women let me pass she continued with greater violence do you not see the poor girl's condition and that you will kill her child she thrust back an old hag who was protesting and all the others gave way fine's words had suddenly made them silent and compassionate both girls were then able to retire blanche crimson with shame nestled in fear against her companion and feverishly hastened her footsteps 
in order to avoid the rue du pont moreau which was then swarming with people and full of noise the flower-girl took the little rue st john on reaching the cour she conducted mademoiselle de cazalis to her residence the door of which was open she had not uttered a single word all the way blanche obliged her to enter the hall and there half closing the door she said to her in an affected tone of voice oh mademoiselle how grateful i am to you for your assistance those wicked women would have killed me don't thank me answered fine sharply i went there like the others to insult and beat you you yes i hate you i wish you had died in your cradle blanche looked at the flower-girl with astonishment she had drawn herself up her aristocratic instincts were getting the better of her and her lips were curling slightly with disdain the two young girls were facing each other one in all her slim gracefulness the other in all her energetic beauty they contemplated each other in silence feeling the rivalry of their race and heart thundering within them you are beautiful and wealthy continued fine bitterly why did you come and rob me of my sweetheart when later on you could only feel contempt and anger for him you should have sought out some one in your own sphere you would have found a youth as pale and cowardly as yourself who would have satisfied your little girlish feeling of love look here do not take our men or if you do we will tear your pink faces i do not understand stammered blanche who was becoming afraid again you don't understand listen i was in love with philippe he came and bought roses of me of a morning and my heart used to beat fit to break when i handed him my nosegays i know now where those flowers went to one day they told me he had run away with you i wept then i thought that you would love him fondly and he would be happy and now you have had him put in prison look here do not let us speak of that or i shall get angry and beat you she stopped palpitating then continued approaching nearer to blanche and burning her icy cold cheeks with her hot breath you don't know then how we love we poor girls we love with all our body with all our courage when we run away with a man we don't say afterwards that he took advantage of our weakness we clasp him in our arms with all our might to defend him ah oh, if philippe had loved me but i am an unhappy girl a poor creature an ugly and fine began to sob and show herself as weak as mademoiselle de cazalis the latter took her hand and in a voice broken with tears answered for pity's sake do not accuse me will you be my friend shall i lay my heart bare to you i suffer so much if you only knew i can do nothing i obey my uncle who subdues me in his grip of iron i am a coward i know it but i have not the strength to be otherwise and i love philippe the memory of him is always within me he told me it would be that my punishment if i ever betrayed him would be to love him eternally to keep him without end in my breast he is there he is burning me he will kill me a short time ago when they sentenced him i felt something within me that made me start and which tore my inside i weep look i ask your pardon all fine's anger had gone she was supporting blanche who was staggering you are right continued the poor child i do not deserve pity i have dealt a blow at the one i love and who will never love me more ah for mercy's sake if he one day become your husband speak to him of my tears ask him to forgive me what drives me mad is that i cannot tell him i worship him he would laugh he would not understand all my cowardice no do not speak to him of me let him forget me i shall be alone to weep there was a painful silence and your child asked fine my child said blanche bewildered i don't know my uncle would take it away from me shall i act as a mother to it the flower-girl uttered these words in a tender and grave voice mademoiselle clasped her in her arms in a passionate embrace oh you are so good she said you know how to love try to see me at marseilles when the hour arrives i will trust in you at this moment the elderly relative returned after having sought in vain for blanche in the crowd fine promptly withdrew and reascended the cour 
as she reached the place de carmelite she perceived marius from afar conversing with philippe's lawyer the young man was in despair he would never have believed that they could pass such a severe sentence on his brother the five years imprisonment terrified him but he was perhaps still more painfully overcome at the thought of the public exhibition on a square at marseilles he recognized the deputy's hand in this punishment m de cazalis had above all wished to deprive philippe of the power of pleasing to render him for ever unworthy of women's love the crowd surrounding marius were clamouring about injustice the public with one voice protesting against the enormity of the punishment and while the young man was engaged in a heated discussion with the lawyer losing his temper and showing symptoms of despair he felt a soft hand on his arm he turned sharply round and perceived fine at his side calm and smiling hope and follow me she said to him in an undertone your brother is saved chapter twelve which shows that a jailer's heart is not always made of stone while marius was running over the town before the trial to no purpose fine had been labouring on her side at the work of deliverance she had engaged in a regular campaign against the conscience of her uncle the jailer revertega she had taken up her quarters with him and passed her days at the prison she did her best from morning to night to make herself useful to be beloved by her uncle who lived alone like a growling bear with his two young daughters she attacked him in his paternal love she was full of charming ways with the children and spent all her savings in toys sweets and small articles of dress the little ones were not in the habit of being spoiled they showed riotous tenderness for their big cousin who danced them on her knees and distributed such nice beautiful things amongst them the father felt affected and thanked fine effusively he experienced the young girl's penetrating influence in spite of himself and was ill-tempered when he had to leave her she seemed to have brought the sweet perfume of her roses and violets with her the lodge smelt nice since she was there merry and light of foot her bright petticoats appeared to bring light air and gaiety all was smiling now in the dark room and revertega remarked with a broad grin that spring had taken up its abode with him the worthy man forgot himself in the caressing effluvia of this spring his heart softened and he lost the harshness and severity of his calling fine was too smart a girl not to play her part with fondling prudence she did not hasten events she brought the jailer little by little to feelings of compassion and kindness then she pitied philippe before him and obliged him to acknowledge that they were detaining him unjustly in prison when she held her uncle in her power off his guard and disposed to be obedient to her wishes she asked him if she could not visit the poor young man's cell he dared not say no but conducted her there allowed her to enter and remained watching at the door fine stood before philippe like a silly thing she gazed at him confused and blushing forgetting what she wanted to say to him the young man recognized her and hastened towards her with a movement full of tenderness and delight you here my dear child he exclaimed ah how kind of you to come to see me will you allow me to kiss your hand philippe assuredly imagined himself in his little apartment in the rue sainte and he was not perhaps far from dreaming of a fresh adventure the flower-girl surprised almost wounded withdrew her hand and gravely contemplated blanche's lover you must be mad monsieur philippe she answered you know very well that you are married now for me let us speak of serious things she lowered her voice and continued rapidly the jailer is my uncle and i have been working at your deliverance for the past week i wanted to see you to tell you that your friends have not forgotten you so hope philippe on hearing this good news regretted his amorous welcome give me your hand he said in an unsteady voice it is a friend who asks you for it to clasp it as an old comrade do you forgive me the flower-girl smiled without answering i think she resumed that i shall soon be able to throw the gate wide open to you on what day would you like to run away run away but i shall be acquitted what is the use of running away if i were to escape i should be acknowledging my guilt fine had not thought of this reasoning to her mind philippe was condemned beforehand but as a matter of fact he was right he must await the judgment as she preserved silence pensive and irresolute revertega gave two gentle knocks at the door to beg her to leave the cell well 
she resumed addressing the prisoner be ready all the same if you are condemned we will prepare your flight your brother and me have faith she withdrew leaving philippe almost in love she had now time before her to win over her uncle she continued the same tactics bewitching the worthy man with her goodness of heart and gracefulness and exciting his pity on his prisoner's lot in the end she even drew her two little cousins into the conspiracy and they at a word would have left their father to follow her one evening after having softened revertiga's heart by all the cajoling she was capable of she ended by boldly asking him for philippe's liberty of course exclaimed the jailer if it only depended on me i would open the door to him immediately but it does only depend on you uncle fine innocently answered ah so you think but the next morning they would turn me adrift and send me starving with my two daughters these words made the flower-girl look quite serious but she resumed after a moment if i gave you money supposing i loved this youth supposing i were to implore you with joined hands to give him back to me you you exclaimed the astonished jailer he had risen he gazed at his niece to see if she were not laughing at him when he observed her grave and troubled manner he bent forward vanquished softened consenting by a sign faith he added i'll do what you like you are too good and pretty a girl for me to refuse fine kissed him and spoke of something else henceforward she was sure of victory on several occasions she returned to the conversation accustoming robert Degas to the idea that he would allow philippe to escape she did not wish to throw her relative into poverty and she offered him a first reward of fifteen thousand francs this offer dazzled the jailer who from that moment belonged to her body and soul and that is how fine had been able to say to marius with her clever smile follow me your brother is saved she accompanied the young man to the prison on the road she related to him all she had been doing how she had little by little won over her uncle marius's straightforward nature set him first of all against the plan then he remembered the intrigues to which m de cazalis had recourse and reflected that after all he was only making use of the same weapons as his adversaries and his mind was at ease he thanked fine most touchingly and was at a loss to know what proof to give her of his gratitude the young girl happy beyond measure hardly listened to his protestations of devotedness they could only see robert Degas in the evening the jailer from the very first words of the conversation pointed out his two little girls who were playing in a corner of the lodge and simply said to marius monsieur they are my excuse i would not ask a sou if i had not these children to feed this was a painful scene for marius he abridged it as much as possible he was aware that the jailer was giving way both to self-sacrifice and interest and if he could not despise him he none the less felt ill at ease at concluding such a bargain with him all was settled in a few minutes marius announced that he would leave the following morning for marseilles and would bring back with him the fifteen thousand francs promised by fine he would get them from his banker his mother had left a sum of fifty thousand francs which was deposited with m Birard, whose house was one of the most important and best known of the city the flower girl was to remain at x and there await the young man's return he set out full of hope with the idea that his brother was already free but as he stepped out of the diligence at marseilles he learned a terrible piece of news which completely staggered him the banker Birard had just been made a bankrupt End of chapters 11 and 12part one chapters thirteen and fourteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen a bankruptcy as there are many marius hastened to the banker Birard. he could not believe the bad news he possessed all the confidence of a straightforward mind on the road he said to himself that the rumours that were afloat were perhaps after all only calumnies and so he clung to false hopes the loss of his fortune at this moment amounted to his brother's discomfiture it seemed to him that chance would not be so cruel the public must be mistaken Birard would hand him his money 
when he entered the banking-house he was seized with a pang of anguish he saw the terrible reality the offices were empty and these spacious rooms deserted and calm with their closed wirework cages appeared to him funeral-like it is difficult to conceive what mournful desolation a fortune that is breaking up leaves behind it from the counting-house ledgers papers escaped a vague odour of ruin seals were to be seen everywhere with their white bands and large blotches of red wax marius crossed three rooms without meeting any one he at length discovered a clerk who had come to remove a few objects belonging to him from a desk and who answered him sharply that m Beral was in his office the young man entered all of a tremble forgetting to close the door he perceived the banker quietly at work writing letters setting papers in order and balancing accounts he was young tall had a handsome and intelligent face was dressed with great care wore rings on his fingers and presented the appearance of a gallant and wealthy man one would have said he had just had a brush up to receive his customers and explain his disaster to them himself moreover his attitude appeared courageous this man was either a victim of circumstances full of resignation or else an arrant rascal brazening out his infamy on seeing marius enter he looked him in the face and his countenance wore an expression of sad straightforwardness i was awaiting you dear sir he said in an unsteady voice you see i am waiting for all those whose ruin i have brought about i shall have courage to the end i want each of them to assure himself that i have no cause to be ashamed he took up a register from his writing-table and opened it with some affectation here are my accounts he continued my liabilities are a million my assets one million five hundred thousand francs the court will adjudicate and i believe my creditors will lose nothing i am the first to suffer i have lost my fortune and credit i have allowed insolvent debtors to rob me in a most bare-faced way marius had not yet uttered a word in face of Beral's broken-down serenity in presence of this display of austere grief he could not find a single reproach not one word of indignation he almost pitied this man who was heading the storm sir he said to him at last why did you not warn me when you saw your affairs getting into a mess and turning to the bad my mother was a friend of your mother's in remembrance of our former intimacy you should have made me withdraw this money which you were about to compromise from your control your present ruin strips me of everything and plunges me in despair Beral ran forward and grasped marius's hands do not say that he exclaimed in a voice broken by tears do not overwhelm me ah you have no idea of the regret that is tormenting me when i saw the abyss i sought to catch hold of the branches i struggled till the last moment hoping to be able to save the amounts deposited in my hands you cannot imagine what terrible risks are run by those who deal in money marius had nothing to answer what could he say to a man who found his excuse in self-accusation he had no proofs he did not dare call Bérard a scamp it only remained to him to withdraw the banker spoke in such an aggrieved tone of voice in such a convinced and straightforward manner that he hastened to go away and leave him to himself he felt oppressed at his misfortune as he was crossing the empty offices again the clerk who had at last gathered his things together took his bundle and hat and followed him this clerk was muttering between his teeth at each step he looked in a strange way at marius and shrugged his shoulders below on the pavement he suddenly approached him well said he what think you of m Beral? he's a splendid actor isn't he the door of his office was open and made me laugh to see his distressed manner he almost wept the honest fellow permit me to tell you that you have just allowed yourself to be duped in the most beautiful way i don't understand you answered marius so much the better that is because you are an honest man for my part i have just left this shop with profound satisfaction i long since expected a stroke of business like this i foresaw the issue of this high comedy of theft i possess a peculiar knack for ferreting out jobbery in a firm explain yourself oh the story is simple i'll relate it to you in a few words ten years ago Beral started a banking business at the present day i have no doubt that he prepared his bankruptcy from the first moment 
this was his reasoning i wish to be rich because i have many desires and to be so as rapidly as possible because i am in a hurry to satisfy them but the straight road is rough and long i prefer to follow the paths of cheating and get my million together in ten years i will make myself a banker i shall have a counting-house where i will take the people's money as a bird-catcher snares the feathered songsters each year i will pilfer a round sum that will last as long as necessary i will stop when my pockets are full then i shall quietly suspend payment on two millions that will have been entrusted to me i will generously return two or three hundred thousand francs to my creditors the remainder hidden away in a little corner i know of will assist me to live as i desire as an idler and a voluptuary do you understand dear sir marius had listened to the clerk with stupefaction but he exclaimed at last what you are telling me is impossible Pirard has just confided to me that his liabilities amount to a million and his assets to a million and a half we shall all be paid in full the clerk held his sides with laughter oh, goodness gracious how simple you are he continued do you really believe in these assets of a million and a half first of all they will deduct madame Bérard's marriage portion from the amount now madame Bérard brought her husband fifty thousand francs which he in the marriage contract transformed into the handsome sum of five hundred thousand francs that as you see was a little robbery of four hundred and fifty thousand francs there remains a million and that million is almost entirely represented by suspicious book debts oh the proceeding is simple enough there are persons at marseilles who sell their signatures for a hundred sous piece and they live very well at this easy and lucrative business Bérard had got men of straw to sign him numbers of acceptances and he pocketed the money which he now pretends he lent to insolvent debtors if they give you ten per cent on your claim you may esteem yourself lucky and you will only receive that in eighteen months or two years when the assignees of the bankruptcy have concluded their work marius was completely upset thus the fifty thousand francs left him by his mother would be useless to him he wanted money at once and they talked to him of waiting two years and his ruin and despair were the work of a scoundrel who had just been laughing at him he flew into a passion this Bérard is a rascal he burst out he will be vigorously hunted down society must be freed of these crafty men who enrich themselves by the ruin of others the galleys await them the clerk again burst out laughing Bérard, he continued will perhaps get a fortnight's imprisonment that is all you don't seem to understand again listen to me you say the galleys await Bérard, continued the clerk the galleys only await clumsy folk during the ten years that our customer has been hatching and nursing his bankruptcy he has taken his precautions infamy such as this is quite a work of art his accounts are in order and he has the law on his side he knew beforehand how slight was the risk he ran the most the court can do will be to reproach him with heavy personal expenses they will tax him besides with having put a large number of bills of exchange in circulation which is a ruinous way of procuring money the penalties for such mistakes are ridiculous Pirard, as i told you will get a fortnight or a month's imprisonment at the most but exclaimed marius cannot one go and proclaim this man's crime on the public square prove it and have him sentenced no indeed one cannot do that proofs are wanting i tell you besides Bérard has not lost his time he has foreseen everything he has made powerful friends at marseilles imagining he would some day have need of their influence he is now a sort of inviolable personage in this city of coteries if they touched a single hair of his head all his friends would yell with grief and rage the most they could do would be to imprison him for form's sake when he leaves jail he will find his little million again he will make a show of luxury and will easily conquer fresh esteem you will then meet him driving out in his carriage extended on his cushions and the wheels of his vehicle will splash you with mud you will find him indifferent and idle with a large establishment enjoying all the luxuries of life and to worthily crown this success in the art of robbery they will bow to him like him and open him a new credit of honour and consideration marius preserved ferocious silence the clerk made him a slight bow and was about to leave him it is thus the farce is played he added 
i had all that on my heart and am glad to have met you to ease myself now a piece of advice keep what i have told you to yourself say good-bye to your money and do not bother any more about the sorry business reflect and you will see i am right good day marius remained alone he had a tremendous desire to rush upstairs to berard and slap him in the face all his instincts of probity and justice had risen up within him urging him to drag the banker out into the street and proclaim his crime then his passion gave way to disgust he remembered his poor mother shamelessly deceived by this man and from that moment he felt nothing but crushing contempt for him he followed the clerk's advice and left the house endeavouring to forget that he had had money and that a rascal had robbed him of it what the clerk had told him was confirmed in every point Bérard was sentenced to a month's imprisonment for simple bankruptcy a year afterwards with florid complexion and easy insolent bearing he sauntered about marseilles displaying the jovial humour of a wealthy man he rang his purse in the clubs restaurants and theatres everywhere in fact where pleasure could be purchased and on his road he invariably met with complacent persons or dupes who bowed to him lowly chapter fourteen in which it is proved that it is possible to spend thirty thousand francs a year when only earning eighteen hundred marius went mechanically down to the port he walked straight on without noticing whither he was going he was so to say in a state of stupefaction one sole thought occupied his otherwise empty brain and kept repeating in a sing-song way that he needed fifteen thousand francs without a moment's loss of time he cast about him the vague glance of persons in despair as though he were looking on the ground to see if he could not find the money he required in the interstices of the paving-stones down at the port he felt a longing to be rich the merchandise piled up along the quays the ships bringing fortunes in their holds the noise the motion of that money-making crowd irritated him never before had he felt his poverty so strongly for a moment he was filled with envy revolt and bitter jealousy he asked himself why was he poor whilst others were rich and still that ever-recurring thought kept ringing in his head fit to break it fifteen thousand francs fifteen thousand francs his brother was awaiting him and he could not go back empty-handed he had only a few hours in which to save him from infamy but he could form no plan his bewildered senses did not furnish him with a single practical idea he turned about in his powerlessness exerted every effort of his mind in vain he struggled almost choking with rage and anguish he could never ask his employer m martelly to lend him fifteen thousand francs his earnings were too small to warrant such a loan moreover he knew the shipowner's upright principles and dreaded his reproaches if he admitted to him that he wished to purchase another's conscience m martelly would at once have refused the money marius suddenly had an idea he would not stay to discuss it in his mind but hurried off to his lodging in the rue sainte on the same floor as himself there resided a young clerk named charles blétry who was employed as a collector at the soap-works of messrs d'astre and degans a kind of intimacy had sprung up between these two young fellows living side by side marius had been won over by charles gentleness for the latter went regularly to church led an exemplary life and appeared to be of the strictest honesty yet during the past two years he had been spending money pretty freely he had refurnished his lodging in a luxurious style buying carpets hangings mirrors and rich furniture besides this he came home later lived more expensively but still remained gentle and honest quiet and pious at first his neighbour's outlay rather astonished marius who could not understand how a clerk earning eighteen hundred francs a year could afford to purchase such expensive things but charles told him that he had inherited some money and that he intended shortly to resign his position and live on his means he even placed himself and his purse at his disposal but marius declined to-day he recalled this offer and was about to knock at the young man's door and ask him for the means to save his brother a loan of fifteen thousand francs would not perhaps inconvenience him seeing how lavishly he was spending his money he proposed to himself to repay the amount in instalments persuaded that his neighbour would grant him all the time necessary the clerk however was not at home in the rue sainte and as marius was pressed for time he went off to messrs d'astre and degans soap-works situated on the boulevard des dames 
when he arrived there and asked for charles blethri it seemed to him that he was eyed in a strange manner the workman told him to address himself to m dast who was in his office surprised at this reception marius decided to do so and found the manufacturer engaged in conversation with three gentlemen who stopped talking directly he showed himself can you tell me sir inquired the young man if m chablitri is at the factory dast exchanged a rapid glance with one of the persons present a stout pale and severe-looking man m chablitri will return presently he replied please wait for him are you a friend of his yes replied marius simply he resides in the same house as i do i have known him for about three years there was a pause the young man thinking he was in the way added with a bow and walking towards the door i am much obliged to you i will wait for him outside then the stout gentleman leant forward and said a few words to the manufacturer in a low voice m dast signed to marius to stay have the goodness to wait here he exclaimed your presence may be useful to us you must know something of m blethri's mode of living and can no doubt give us some information about him marius greatly astonished and not understanding hesitated excuse me resumed m dast with great politeness i see that my words surprise you and indicating the stout man he went on that gentleman is the police commissary of the district and i have sent for him to arrest charles blethri who has robbed us of sixty thousand francs in two years on hearing charles accused of theft marius understood everything he accounted for the young fellow's lavish expenditure and shuddered at the thought that he had been on the point of accepting his offers of service he would never have believed that his neighbour could have been guilty of a mean action he knew very well that there existed at marseilles as in all great centres of industry clerks who robbed their employers in order to satisfy their vices and their love of luxury he had often heard of clerks earning a hundred or a hundred and fifty francs a month and who managed to lose immense sums in gambling in the clubs to throw gold to loose women and to idle away their time in restaurants and cafes but charles seemed so pious so modest so honest he had played the hypocrite so artfully that marius had been taken in by these appearances of probity and he even now entertained doubts despite m dast's formal accusation he seated himself and awaited the development of the drama as a matter of fact he could not very well have done otherwise during half an hour a mournful silence reigned in the office the manufacturer was writing whilst the police commissary and the two officers mute and looking half asleep gazed vaguely before them with terrible patience such a sight was calculated to make marius honest had he been disposed to be otherwise a step was heard outside and the door slowly opened here's our man said m dast rising from his seat charles blethri entered quite unsuspiciously without even noticing the persons who were there you wish to see me sir he asked in that drawling voice peculiar to clerks when addressing their employers as m dast was looking him straight in the face he turned round and beheld the police commissary whom he knew by sight he became ghastly pale understanding that he was lost and his whole body trembled he had just walked into the meshes of the law with his eyes shut seeing that his frightened looks were accusing him he tried to pull himself together and to recover a little coolness and audacity yes i wish to see you m dast explained violently and you know why don't you ah scoundrel you'll never rob me again i don't know what you mean stammered blethri i've never robbed you what is it you accuse me of the police commissary had seated himself at the manufacturer's desk ready to draw up his report whilst the two officers were guarding the door kindly tell me sir said the police commissary to m dast how you discovered that m blethri had been guilty of embezzling your money then m dast told the story of the crime he noticed that occasionally his collector was an extremely long time in getting in certain monies but as he had unlimited confidence in the young man he attributed these delays to the dilatoriness of his customers the first embezzlement must have occurred quite eighteen months back anyhow the day before one of his customers being on the verge of bankruptcy he had gone personally to demand payment of an account amounting to five thousand francs and had thereupon learnt that blethri had collected it some weeks previously much alarmed he had hurried back to the factory and by going through the cashier's books had convinced himself that about sixty thousand francs were missing 
the police commissary then proceeded to question blitry the latter taken unawares and unable to deny the facts concocted a ridiculous story one day he said i lost my pocket-book containing forty thousand francs i had not the courage to tell m d'est of this great misfortune so i embezzled some money to gamble on the stock exchange hoping to win and so reimburse the firm the police commissary asked him for particulars confused him by his questions and forced him to contradict himself Blitry then tried another falsehood you are right he resumed and i did not lose the pocket-book i prefer to tell you everything the truth is i was robbed myself i gave shelter to a young man who was hard up one night he went off with my collector's bag and it contained a considerable sum of money come don't make your crime worse by lying said the commissary with that terrifying patience of police officials you know very well that we can't believe you it's no use inventing such rigmaroles he then turned to marius and continued i asked m das to detain you sir thinking you might be useful to us in our inquiry the accused is you said your neighbour do you know anything about his mode of life will you not beseech him with us to tell the truth marius felt dreadfully embarrassed he pitied Blitry, who was reeling like a drunken man and looking at him imploringly the man was not a hardened scoundrel no doubt he had given way to temptation to a weak mind and heart but marius's conscience would not be stilled and commanded him to say what he knew he did not reply to the police commissary directly but preferred to address himself to Blitry. listen charles he said i do not know whether you are guilty i have always found you good and quiet i am aware that you support your mother and that you are beloved by all who know you if you have been guilty of wrong admit your folly you will cause less suffering to those who love and esteem you by frankly owning your guilt and showing sincere repentance marius spoke in a gentle and convincing voice Blitry, whom the curt words of the police commissary had left dumb and inwardly irritated gave way before his friend's kindness he thought of his mother he thought of the esteem and the friendships he was about to lose and his emotion nearly choked him he burst into sobs weeping hot tears in his closed hands and for some minutes no sound was heard by the heart-rending cry of his despair it was a complete avowal the spectators of the scene remained silent well yes Blitry exclaimed at last amidst his tears i have robbed i'm a scoundrel i didn't know what i was about i commenced by taking a few hundred francs then i required a thousand two thousand five thousand ten thousand francs at a time it seemed as if someone was behind me urging me on and my needs my appetites were ever increasing but what did you do with all that money asked the police commissary i don't know i gave it away lost it at play devoured it somehow you don't know the life i was happy enough in my poverty and troubled with nothing i loved to go to church and to live worthily like an honest man but then i had a taste of luxury and vice i got to know women i bought expensive things i was mad can you give me the names of the women with whom you squandered the money you were embezzling as if i knew their names i met them here there everywhere in the streets and at public balls they came because i had my pockets full of gold and they went off when they were empty then i lost a lot playing baccarat at the clubs what turned me into a thief was seeing certain well-born young men throwing their money out of window and revelling in wealth and idleness i wanted to know women as they did to have noisy joys nights spent in gambling and debauchery i required thirty thousand francs a year and i was only earning eighteen hundred so i ended by stealing the poor wretch suffocating overcome by grief dropped on to a chair marius went up to m d'ast who was also much affected and beseeched him to be merciful he then hastened to withdraw from a scene which made his heart bleed he left Blitry quite prostrated by a kind of nervous stupor some months later he learnt that the young man had been condemned to five years imprisonment 
once outside marius experienced a great feeling of relief he understood that by assisting at charles arrest he had received a lesson a few hours before when down at the port he had indulged in some evil ideas of fortune he had just seen where such thoughts might lead him and suddenly he remembered why he had gone to the soap-works he had only an hour left in which to find the fifteen thousand francs which were to save his brother End of chapters thirteen and fourteen part one chapters fifteen and sixteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen philippe refuses to save himself marius had to admit to himself how powerless he was he knew not at what door to knock it is not easy for a simple clerk to borrow fifteen thousand francs in the course of an hour he walked slowly down the rue x straining his mind but finding nothing in his wearied brain money troubles are terrible one would sooner battle with an assassin than fight against the imperceptible and crushing phantom of poverty nobody has ever yet been able to conjure up a five-franc piece when the young man hopeless and at his wit's end reached the cour Bazins, he decided to return to x empty-handed the coach was about to start and there was only one vacant seat left an outside one he took it with delight preferring to remain in the open air for anxiety was stifling him and he hoped that the vast horizon of the open country would calm his fever it was a sad journey in the morning he had passed the same trees the same hills and hope which brought a smile to his lips then shed a joyous brightness over the fields and slopes now as he again beheld the same countryside he enveloped it in all the gloom that was weighing on his mind the heavy vehicle lumbered on the cultivated land the pine woods the little hamlets succeeded each other at either side of the road and marius found in each change of landscape a deeper air of mourning a more poignant grief night fell and it seemed to him that the entire country was covered by an immense pall on reaching x he walked slowly towards the prison he felt that he would always arrive too soon with his evil news when he entered the jail it was nine o'clock robert Tega and fine were killing time by having a game at cards on a corner of the table a flower-girl jumped up gleefully and ran to meet the young man well she asked him with a bright smile and throwing back her head coquettishly marius had not the courage to reply he sat down exhausted speak up cried fine you've got the money no the young man answered simply after a moment he told them of Bérard's failure Blétry's arrest all the misfortunes he had encountered at marseilles he wound up by saying i am now no more than a poverty-stricken wretch my brother will remain a prisoner the flower-girl remained painfully surprised her hands clasped in that attitude of pity peculiar to provencal women she repeated in a rueful tone of voice how sad how sad she looked at her uncle and seemed to be urging him to speak robert Tega eyed the two young people compassionately it was evident that a struggle was taking place within him at length he seemed to make up his mind and said to marius listen to me sir my duties have not hardened me to such an extent as to render me insensible to the sufferings of worthy people i have already said why i was willing to sell you your brother's freedom but i do not wish you to think that the love of money alone is prompting me if unfortunate circumstances prevent your placing me at once out of the reach of poverty i will nevertheless open the door to m philippe you can come to my assistance later on and pay me the fifteen thousand francs little by little when you are able to do so fine clapped her hands on hearing these words she flung her arms round her uncle's neck and embraced him heartily marius looked very grave as he replied i cannot accept your sacrifice i am already reproaching myself with having tempted you to disregard your duty and i refuse to increase my responsibility by also casting you adrift without a crust of bread the flower-girl turned to the young man almost angrily hold your tongue she cried monsieur philippe must be saved i intend that he shall be besides we don't need you to open the prison doors come uncle 
if m philippe is willing his brother can have nothing to say marius followed the young woman and the jailer who were going in the direction of the prisoner's cell they had taken a dark lantern and were gliding softly along the passages in order not to excite remark all three entered the cell and closed the door behind them philippe was asleep robert Degas, moved by his niece's tears had softened the prison regulations as much as possible for the young man he brought him lunch and dinner which fine herself prepared he lent him books and had even given him an additional rug the cell had been made habitable and philippe was not too uncomfortable there he knew moreover that they were working for his escape he woke up and held out his hands effusively to his brother and the flower girl you have come for me he asked smiling yes answered fine dress yourself at once marius remained silent his heart was beating quickly he feared that a strong desire for liberty might lead his brother to accept the means of flight which he himself had thought right to decline so everything is agreed and arranged resumed philippe i may go off without fear or regret you have paid the promised amount you don't answer me marius fine hastened to intervene haven't i told you to make haste she cried what are you troubling yourself about she threw him his clothes and added that she would wait in the passage marius stopped her excuse me he said i cannot leave my brother in ignorance of our misfortunes and in spite of fine's impatience he related again the result of his journey to marseilles he however gave his brother no advice but left him at full liberty to come to a decision himself so then exclaimed philippe completely crushed you've not given the money to the jailer and we're without a copper don't worry yourself about that replied robert Tega, drawing near you can help me later on the prisoner said nothing he was no longer thinking of his escape his thoughts were centred on his poverty on the sorry figure he would henceforth cut once he was at liberty no more smart clothes no more strolls in fashionable haunts no more love adventures but besides all this he had some chivalrous feelings some poetical ideas which forbade him accepting robertiga's sacrifice he lay back on his miserable bed drew the clothes up to his chin and said quietly very well i shall stay where i am marius's face beamed fine looked overwhelmed she tried to prove the necessity for the escape she spoke of the public exhibition of the infamy of the pillory she grew excited and looked superb in her passion and philippe gazed at her admiringly my beautiful child he replied you might succeed in making me yield if i had not grown blind and obstinate in this cell but really i have done enough mean things already without wishing to burden my conscience with any more we are in the hands of providence moreover all is not yet lost marius will free me he'll find the money somehow you see if he don't you shall come and fetch me when you've paid my ransom and we'll fly together and i'll give you a kiss he spoke almost gaily marius took his hand thanks brother he said be of good cheer fine and robert Tega went out whilst philippe and marius remained alone a few minutes they had some serious and affecting conversation they spoke of blanche and the child she was expecting when the visitors were back in the jailer's room the flower girl in despair asked marius what he thought of doing i shall make some further efforts he replied unfortunately we have not much time and i scarcely know where to seek assistance i can give you a piece of advice observed robert Tega. there's a banker in this town living close by here named rostand who would perhaps consent to lend you a considerable sum but i must warn you that this rostand has the reputation of being an usurer marius had not the choice of means thanks he said i will call on the man to-morrow chapter sixteen the usurers m rostand was a clever man he pursued his shameful calling undisturbed to give an honest appearance to his trade he had opened a banking-house and having paid for the license he was legally established at times he could even be a trifle honest and would lend money at the same rate of interest as the other bankers of the town but there was so to say a back office in his establishment wherein he took delight in elaborating his knavish schemes six months after the opening of his bank he became the managing director of a company of usurers a black band which entrusted him with certain funds for investment 
the combination was of a simplicity quite patriarchal people endowed him with the bump of usury and who feared to indulge their propensity at their own risk and peril brought him their money and requested him to turn it to good account by these means he always had a considerable capital to turn over and was enabled to take full advantage of needy borrowers those who furnished the money remained in the background he had solemnly undertaken to lend at a fabulous rate of interest at fifty sixty and even eighty per cent the sleeping partners met at his office once a month he produced his accounts and they shared the spoil but he so arranged matters as to keep the larger share for himself in fact he robbed the robbers it was especially against the small traders that he directed his operations when a shopkeeper came to see him the day before a payment fell due he imposed most exorbitant terms the tradesman invariably accepted them and in this way he had brought about more than fifty failures in ten years moreover all was fish that came to his net he would as soon lend five francs to a market woman as a thousand to a cattle dealer he kept a sharp lookout and never lost an opportunity of investing ten francs one day to receive twelve the next he was on the watch for noble youths fast young men who fling their money out of window he filled their hands with gold so that they might throw the more and he stood outside to pick up what they threw he also took trips into the country and tempted the peasants when the crops failed he dispossessed them piece by piece of their land and farms his house had thus become a veritable pitfall which swallowed up whole fortunes the individuals the entire families he had ruined were well known no one was ignorant of his underhand dealings his sleeping partners were pointed at in the streets wealthy men ex-officials merchants and even workmen but proof was lacking his banker's license shielded him and he was too clever to allow himself to be caught napping since he had first started his nefarious speculations rostand had only once found himself in danger the affair created a great sensation a lady belonging to a wealthy family borrowed a rather large sum of him she was very pious and had bereft herself of her fortune by giving money and charity on all sides knowing that she was completely without means he insisted upon her signing bills with her brother's name having these forgeries in his possession he was certain of being paid by the brother who would be anxious to avoid a scandal the poor lady signed as required charity had ruined her and the weak kindliness of her nature brought about her fall his calculations turned out correct and the first bills were paid but as more and more were presented the brother grew tired of paying and determined to get to the bottom of the matter he called on rostand and threatened to expose him he said that he would sooner see his sister disgrace than allow himself to be further robbed with impunity by such a scoundrel the usurer thoroughly cowed gave up the bills he still possessed he did not however lose a copper on the transaction having advanced the loan at cent per cent since then rostand had been extremely careful he invested the capital of the black band with a skill which won him the admiration and confidence of the usurers whilst his sleeping partners were airing themselves in the sunshine like worthy people who would never rob a soul he remained buried in a great dark office it was there that the golden coins of the concern grew and multiplied rostand had ended by acquiring quite an affection for his fraudulent and thiefish trade some members of the band applied their profits to satisfying their passions their appetites for luxurious and dissolute living he took his sole delight in being a clever rascal he felt as much interest in each of his operations as if it had been a drama or a comedy he was witnessing he applauded himself when his plan succeeded and then felt the pride the joy of a successful author then he spread out on a table the money he had stolen and lost himself in all the voluptuous sensations of the miser it was to such a man that robert had naively sent marius the latter knocked at rostand's door on the following morning towards eight o'clock it was a heavy square house and the closed shutters gave it a bare cold appearance an air of mystery and mistrust a toothless old waiting-woman attired in a dirty ragged cotton gown opened a door a few inches monsieur rostand asked marius he is in but engaged replied the servant without opening the door any wider the young man losing patience pushed the door open and entered the hall very well he said i'll wait surprised and scarcely knowing what to do 
the servant seeing she could not get rid of him took him up to the first floor and left him by himself in a kind of ante-room it was a small dark apartment hung with greenish wallpaper discoloured by large damp stains the only furniture consisted in a rush-bottomed chair upon which maria seated himself opposite him an open door showed the interior of an office in which a clerk was writing with a quill pen which made a grating noise as it travelled over the paper there was another door on his left which probably led to the banker's private room marius waited a long time the stale smell of old papers pervaded the atmosphere around him the apartment was sickeningly dirty and the nakedness of the walls gave it a lugubrious appearance dust was accumulated in all the corners and cobwebs hung from the ceiling the young man was suffocating and getting out of patience with the grating of the quill pen which kept on increasing suddenly he heard voices in the adjoining room and as the words reached him clear and distinct he was on the point of discreetly moving further off when certain expressions rooted him to the spot there are some conversations which it is permissible to overhear scrupulousness not being intended as a safeguard of the privacy of certain people a harsh voice no doubt that of the master of the house was saying with friendly bluntness gentlemen we are all here let's talk business the sitting is open i will render you a faithful account of my operations of the month and we will then proceed to the division of the profits there was slight noise a sound of private conversations dying away marius who so far had not understood felt nevertheless a lively curiosity he guessed that some strange scene was taking place on the other side of the door as a matter of fact the usurer rostand was closeted with his worthy associates of the black band the young man had called just at the time of their meeting when the managing director was about to produce his accounts explain his operations and divide the spoil the harsh voice continued before entering into details i must inform you that this month's results are not so good as last month's we then had an average of sixty per cent to-day we have only fifty-five various exclamations arose similar to the protesting murmurs of a dissatisfied crowd there must have been about fifteen persons in the room gentlemen continued rostand with bitter raillery i have done what i could and you ought to thank me the business becomes more difficult every day however here are my accounts and i will give you a rapid statement of some of the affairs i have transacted complete silence ensued for a few seconds then there was a rustling of paper and the sound of the leaves of a ledger being turned over marius beginning to understand listened more attentively than ever rostand commenced to go over his various operations giving some explanations as to each one he spoke in the sing-song voice of a court official i lent he said ten thousand francs to young count de salvi a youth of twenty who will attain his majority in nine months time he had lost at play and his mistress it seems required a large amount from him he signed bills at three months for eighteen thousand francs these bills are post-dated the day of his majority so as to make all secure the family owns large estates it's an excellent affair a flattering murmur greeted the usurer's words on the morrow he continued i received a visit from the count's mistress who was exasperated her lover only having given her two or three thousand franc notes she swore that she would bring me the count bound hand and foot to negotiate a fresh loan i shall then require the assignment of one of his estates we have still nine months to shear the young fool whom his mother leaves without money rostand turned over some leaves of the ledger and resumed after a short silence jourdier a cloth merchant who each month requires a few hundred francs to meet his bills at the present time his business belongs almost entirely to us i last lent him five hundred francs at sixty per cent if he asks for anything next month i'll make him bankrupt and we shall take the whole of his stock marianne a market woman every morning she wants ten francs and every evening she returns me fifteen i fancy she drinks it's a small affair but a certain profit a fixed income of five francs a day laurent a peasant of the roque favour district he has made over to me piece by piece some land he owned near arc the ground is worth five thousand francs and has only cost us two thousand i had the man evicted from the place and his wife and children came here and made quite a scene you'll take it into account i hope these annoyances i have to put up with andre a miller he owed us eight hundred francs and i threatened him with an execution 
he hurried here and implored me not to ruin him by letting every one know of his insolvency i consented to effect the seizure myself without employing a bailiff and by that means i obtained over twelve hundred francs worth of furniture and linen i made quite four hundred francs by being good-natured a tremor of satisfaction passed through his colleagues marius could hear the smothered laughter of those men who were rejoicing at rostand's cleverness the latter continued now for the simple cases three thousand francs at forty per cent to the merchant simon fifteen hundred francs at fifty per cent to charançon the cattle dealer two thousand francs at eighty per cent to the marquis de cantarelle one hundred francs at thirty-five per cent to the son of tingray the notary and rostand went on thus for a quarter of an hour reading out names and figures mentioning loans varying from ten francs to ten thousand and interest from twenty to one hundred per cent but what were you telling us my dear friend asked a thick husky voice when he had finished you have worked wonderfully well this last month all these assets are excellent it is impossible for the profit not to average more than fifty-five per cent you no doubt made a mistake when you mentioned that figure i never make a mistake the usurer curtly answered marius who had almost placed his ear against the door thought he noticed some hesitation in the wretch's voice i have not yet told you everything rostand continued with embarrassment we lost twelve thousand francs a week ago these words created quite an uproar and marius hoped for a moment that these scoundrels would set upon one another hang it all listen to me cried the banker amid the tumult i help you to make enough money for you to excuse me if you lose some once in a way besides it wasn't my fault i was robbed he uttered these words with all the indignation of an honest man when quiet was restored he added here's the whole story monnier a corn dealer and a solvent man about whom i had obtained reliable information came to borrow twelve thousand francs i said i could not lend them myself but that i knew an old skinflint who would perhaps advance the money at exorbitant interest he called again the next day and told me that he was ready to agree to any conditions i told him that five thousand francs interest for six months was required he agreed you see it was as good as a gold mine whilst i went to fetch the cash he sat down at my table and wrote out seventeen bills of a thousand francs each i examined them and placed them on the corner of this desk then i conversed a few minutes with monnier who got up and after putting his money away prepared to leave when he was gone i took the documents to put them in a place of safety but just fancy the rogue had changed the bills for a similar bundle of worthless ones scribbled all over payable to the deuce knows who and unsigned i was robbed and nearly had a fit i ran after the swindler whom i found strolling along the cour in the sunshine at the first word i uttered he called me a usurer and threatened me with the police commissary that monnier has the reputation of being a loyal and upright man and so upon reflection i preferred to hold my tongue this story had been several times interrupted by the angry remarks of the listeners you must admit rostand that you have been wanting in energy observed the husky voice well we've lost our money and we'll only get fifty-five per cent another time you must look after our interests better now we'll divide the profits in spite of his anguish and indignation marius could not help smiling monnier's robbery was like a grand piece of comedy and in his heart he applauded the knave who had cheated a knave he now knew the trade rostand followed he had not lost a word of what had been said in the adjoining room and he easily pictured to himself the scene that had been passing there leaning back on his chair his ear close to the door he could see in his mind's eye the usurers quarrelling among themselves with eager looks and faces contracted by the evil passions which were agitating them he felt a kind of bitter mirth when he thought of his reason for coming to that thieves den what simplicity good heavens it was there he had thought to obtain the fifteen thousand francs which were to save philippe and he had not been waiting an hour for the banker to turn him out like a beggar or else rostand would demand fifty per cent interest and rob him impudently at that thought and with the knowledge that there was there close to him a meeting of rascals who throve on the shame and misfortunes of a town he jumped up and laid his hand on the door-handle one could hear the clink of gold within the room the usurers were dividing their spoil each one was pocketing his share of a month's swindling 
that money which they were counting and whose music voluptuously titillated their flesh seemed at times to sob aloud amidst the quivering silence broken only by the banker's voice uttering figures with metallic harshness he calculated each one's share named an amount and let fall a pile of jingling coins marius turned the handle and with pale face and resolute gaze stood a few seconds silent in the doorway the young man had a strange spectacle before him rostand was standing at his table behind him was an open safe from which he took handfuls of gold around the table were seated the members of the black band some awaiting their share others pocketing the money they had just received every minute the banker consulted his accounts examining a ledger and doled out the money with a careful hand his confederates were watching his movements at the sound of the opening door all the heads turned quickly round with fright and when they beheld marius grave and indignant they instinctively closed their fingers on their heaps of gold for a moment all was confusion and apprehension the young man recognized the wretches perfectly he had met them in the streets with heads erect and dignified means and he had even bowed to some who might have saved his brother they were all wealthy esteemed and influential there were among them ex-government officials landed proprietors and persons who frequented the churches and drawing-rooms of the town to see them thus cringing and paling beneath his gaze he could not restrain a movement of disgust rostand rushed forward his eyes blinking feverishly his thick discoloured lips trembling all his miser's red and wrinkled face expressing a sort of sacred surprise what d do you want he asked marius stammering you have no right to walk into a house in this manner i wanted fifteen thousand francs replied the young man in a cold and scoffing tone of voice i've no money the usurer hastened to say retreating to the door of his safe oh be easy i no longer wish to be robbed i must tell you that i've been waiting an hour on the other side of the door and have heard all you've been saying this statement came like the blow of a club and caused the members of the black band to bow their heads these men had still some slight feeling of respectability left and there were some who hid their faces in their hands rostand having no reputation to lose gradually recovered himself he again went up to marius and raised his voice who are you he cried by what right do you come into my house listening at doors why do you come into my private office if you have nothing to ask of me who am i said the young man in a calm quiet tone i am an honest man and you are a rascal by what right did i listen at this door by the right that respectable people have of unmasking scoundrels why have i come in here simply to tell you that you are a villain rostand was trembling with rage he could not account for the presence of this avenger who thus told him the truth to his face he was about to shout out to fall upon marius when the latter energetically motioned him back keep quiet he resumed i am going i am stifling here but i would not go without relieving my feelings a bit ah gentlemen you have a voracious appetite you gluttonously share among you the tears and despair of entire families you gorge yourselves with robbery and swindling i am glad to be able to trouble your digestion a trifle and to make you shiver with anxiety rostand attempted to stop him but he continued in a louder tone of voice highwaymen possess at least courage they fight and risk their lives but you gentlemen you rob shamelessly in secret and to think that it was not necessary for you to become swindlers to live you are every one of you well to do you behave like scoundrels heaven forgive me for pleasure some of the usurers rose menacingly you've never before seen the anger of an honest man have you added marius scoffingly truth both annoys and frightens you you are accustomed to be treated with the respect due to decent people and as you have arranged to hide your baseness and to live esteemed by all you have ended by yourselves believing in the respect accorded to your hypocrisy well i have chosen that for once in your lives you should be insulted as you deserve and that's why i entered here the young man saw that they would fall upon him if he went on he retreated step by step towards the door keeping the usurer at bay by the firmness of his gaze once there he stopped again i know very well gentlemen he said that i cannot bring you to the bar of human justice your wealth your influence and your skill render you inviolable 
if i were foolish enough to fight against you it is i no doubt who would be crushed but anyhow i shall not have to reproach myself with having been in the company of such men as you without having shewn them my contempt i would that my words were red-hot irons that would brand you on your faces the crowd would follow you with its howls and perhaps the lesson would do you good share your gold if there's an atom of honesty left in you it will burn your hands marius closed the door and went off when he reached the street he smiled sadly he saw life spread out before him in all its shame and wretchedness and perceived he was performing the noble and ridiculous part of a don quixote of justice and honour End of chapters 15 and 16